Awesome. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, well, I always enjoy getting to come every year. I really did draw the short end of the stick having to follow uh, Dr. Fisher today. Uh, clearly, he's the most knowledgeable person about farm policy in the country. You can quote me on that, especially if you're saying it to Dr. Outlaw. Make sure and let him know that I said Dr. Fisher is the most knowledgeable person on farm policy. Uh, I, to be clear, I am not late because I am scared of the snow. My kid's school had a two-hour delay. And so I got to deal with that this morning. They built an igloo in their extra two hours before we went to school. So it's been a day for me already. Um, we'll get started. I, I do this every year, right? It's my little disclaimer that says I'm a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. So I'm going to give you some general information today. I'm not giving anybody specific legal advice. If you need that, you got to go find somebody who bills you by the hour, okay? So uh, with that, here's what I'm going to try to cover in the next hour here or so. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of ag law resources I'll just mention. Um, and then I want to talk briefly about carbon contracts. We spent the whole time last year on that topic, but I just want to hit the high notes of that again. Then we'll talk about the WOTUS rule. Are you guys aware that there is a new rule on waters of the United States? Came out over Christmas break. That's a happy holiday for everyone. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about a couple of ag law cases that are at the United States Supreme Court. I think those are really interesting, uh, really important cases. We'll talk about a Supreme Court decision involving the high-speed rail that's really just interesting more than practical here, at least for now. Um, a case about a rancher and an oil company, a couple of honorable mentions, and then I want to talk to you about two of my pet peeves. If y'all are not excited to find out what things drive me crazy, get there, because I'm telling you, my last pet peeves are going to be enjoyable for us all, okay? So the first thing I've got is, um, I have a blog. I know several of you guys are, are followers and readers. I appreciate that. If you're interested in ag law, I just post once or twice a week when something happens. So anything we're going to talk about today, we've done blog posts on. Uh, if a new case comes out, if I do a new checklist, if we write a handbook, any of those things, I'm going to write an article about it. If you go to that website there at the top, or you can use your phone on that code, um, well, if you get one of those annoying pop-up boxes, I'm sorry, I know. But if you put your email address in there and click subscribe, you'll get added to my mailing list. And every time I write an article, it'll go right to you in your email. So if you're interested in ag law, feel free to sign up. I think um, good information, they're a way to stay kind of on top of what's going on. I also have a podcast. So if y'all are podcast listeners, you can just look for ag law in the field on any of your podcast apps. If you don't even know what a podcast is, that's okay, right? It's just where I do audio interviews with lawyers on different topics and post them where you can listen. So what you can do is if you go to that website there at the top, aglaw.libsyn.com, what you're going to find is 145 interviews with some of the best ag lawyers around the country. Find the one you want. You can do it on your phone or your computer. Find the topic you want, push play, and you can listen for free. Okay, so that's available as well. As you can imagine, in 145 episodes, we've really sort of covered the gamut um, of ag law. Some good uh, information there as well. So with that, let's jump into carbon contracts. Like I say, we talked about this last year. I know several of you have been at other meetings where this was a topic I've discussed, so we're not going to run through everything. We are going to hit a couple of high notes. One thing I want to do first, though, is set the stage for when we talk about carbon contracts, what are we even talking about, all right? Currently, when I'm talking about carbon contracts, what we're talking about are voluntary third-party contractual agreements, okay, that a farmer enters into with some company to undertake certain practices on their property, okay? What we're not talking about is some of the things Dr. Fisher mentioned, government programs, cap and trade programs, other things where the government is going to impose regulations or the government is going to create a program and issue payments. We're not talking about that. That's not what we're focused on. We're focused here on these, again, third-party voluntary contracts. So what is even happening? Well, these ads give you a good idea. Companies have decided that they want to, one of the things they want to market is that they are uh, environmentally friendly, right? They're carbon neutral, carbon friendly companies. So I think United Airlines is a great example. 
United Airlines says they're going to be carbon neutral by 2050. Okay? That's hard for United Airlines to do. Right? Why? Because what's their whole business? Burning jet fuel, right? And what does that do? Emits carbon. Okay? So how on earth is United Airlines going to be carbon neutral by 2050? They're not going to have no carbon emissions. They're going to keep having carbon emissions. What they're going to do is pay somebody else to generate what's called an offset. Right? Someone else is going to reduce their emissions or sequester additional carbon in the soil, and United is going to buy that credit. And they'll buy enough of those to offset their output. That's how these contracts are working. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. Now, for most of you, United Airlines isn't knocking on your door, right? I haven't met the CEO coming to offer me a carbon contract. But who I have met who has come knocking and sending letters in the mail are what I would call aggregators, kind of middlemen companies, right, who are going out and gathering up folks who are willing to sign the contracts. You sign with the middleman. They buy your carbon credit that you generate, and then they sell it to United Airlines. Okay, so most of what we're seeing involves kind of the aggregator middleman model. Again, I've got lots of information on this. We have a podcast. I've got a long, like, checklist article. So if you're looking into carbon contracts, before you sign, please check out the resources that we have. I think really useful, especially when you're evaluating a contract and trying to see if there are terms you want to change. Okay, I'm going to walk you through just a few of the key considerations. What do you think the most important thing about a carbon contract is? What's the most important thing for you to do? Read it. Amen. Thank you. Read the contract. And I don't mean like farmer style read it. I know about that, right? Because I got a dad who when he reads a contract, he does this. He like reads the first paragraph, shakes his head, says all lawyers are stupid, flips to the back and finds the dollar amount, right? You know. And then he signs it. That's not what I want you to do, okay? These contracts, guys, they're new. It's a topic that's different. Every contract is really different. As far as the variance from company to company, extremely different contracts that you'll see. And I'm just telling you, having read a bunch of these now, the devil is in the details, and you are going to be shocked at some of the things in the fine print on some of these contracts. So I am begging you. If you're going to I'm not against you signing a carbon contract. If you think that run the math and it'll work for your operation, go for it. But I'm begging you, make sure you read the contract. I would hire an attorney to help me read through it and negotiate the terms because I, people are going to be shocked at some of the things they've signed off on if you're not reading them. The second thing you want to ask for, make sure you understand the payment structure of your contract. You can kind of put these into two buckets. The easier bucket is called payment for practice. You adopt a practice and you get a payment, right? So what practices do we see? A lot of the contracts are going to require you to do no-till or strip-till. Uh, cover crops is a big one. On the livestock side, it's regenerative grazing that we see. So under a payment for practice contract, let's say you say, I'll do cover crops. You implement cover crops, you get a per acre payment just for implementing the practice. Okay, those are more straightforward. There are some of those available. Most of the contracts they're offering right now are payment for outcome. And what that means is you adopt the practice. So let's say you start uh, planting cover crops. And then they're going to come out and actually measure the amount of carbon in the soil. And or they're going to use some sort of modeling tool to figure this out. Okay, and you're going to get paid on the increase of carbon in your soil. So hear me, what happens if I plant a cover crop and for whatever reason the carbon in my soil doesn't increase? Do I get paid? Not on a payment for outcome. So make sure you understand the difference in those two contracts. This is a big one. This one really matters. You have to understand your potential for sequestration in your area. 
Because this is what people keep telling me. They'll say they're offering me a carbon contract and the amount that they'll pay is, say 20 is probably pretty standard. They say they'll pay $20 an acre. Nobody has gotten a $20 an acre offer on a carbon contract. What you're getting is an offer that says $20 per ton of carbon stored. Okay, if you read the, the fine print, that's what most of them are. $20 per ton of carbon stored. So if you could store a ton of carbon, that's $20, right? Anybody know the average sequestration rate for the United States for carbon? 0.6. So the average is 0.6. Anybody know what that number is in our part of the world? Panhandle South Plains. Less. Yeah, 0.1. So what I'm telling you is, if they're offering you $20 per ton of carbon stored, but on average, average, you can store 0.1, I'm not great at math. I went to law school, right? But all of a sudden, that $20 is how many dollars? $2. Can you afford to implement these different practices, like no-till, like cover crops, like regenerative grazing? for less than $2 an acre where you're gonna be in the black, better do the math, right, and figure that out before you sign a contract. This is another one that they love to say. Um, companies will come and, and they'll tell people, just sign up with us, sign the contract, you can try it, and if it doesn't work, you can just walk away. Can I tell y'all a secret? You don't ever get to just walk away from a contract. You want to know why? People like me have jobs to make sure that doesn't happen, right? That's why lawyers exist. So what they should say is you can terminate the contract early, but then you face all of the consequences from doing that. And what are those consequences? It depends on the contract. Some of them say you have to pay back every payment they've made you. Some of them say you have to pay back any expense the company had related to your contract. Okay? You got to pay attention. You, you don't just get to walk away. They may let you terminate early, but make sure you understand the consequences that flow from that decision. I think another important question for us to ask is if I enter into this contract, what other uses are allowed on the property? This would be a big deal for my family, for example. We have, um, we sell hunting leases, right? So if I do a carbon contract, can I still have hunting, hunters come and lease our hunting rights? I don't know. I, I, I'd want to clear that with the company, right? Because again, I don't, if I, uh, I don't want to trade $2 an acre for the amount I make from my antelope hunters, right? So you got to check that as well. The breadth of the stacking provision, this one actually is also really important, and this is the stuff in the fine print. Every contract has what's called a stacking provision, and at the base level, what it says is, if you sign up this piece of property with company A and sell your carbon credit to company A, you can't sign up the same property with company B, right? That makes sense. In other words, you can't double sell the carbon. That's fine. But the way a lot of them are written is much broader than that. And some of them actually say you can't enter into any other or can't receive any other payments related to carbon. Well, what happens if in the new farm bill there's some big carbon program and the government's going to make payments and you want to sign up? May not be able to. Some of them actually, I think the way I read them, are written to say you can't receive any sort of government payment related to that land. This table loves that idea, right? So there goes what? ARC, PLC, maybe Stacks, SCO, Equip, PRF. Better read those stacking provisions to make sure we understand what we're giving up, right? Um, the right to assign the contract. Every contract I've seen lets the company assign it to another company without your permission. So if you're like me, you do all your homework before you sign up with a company, right? I figure out this is the one company I think I can do business with. Tomorrow, they could assign it to the company I never would have signed a contract with, right? So just be aware uh, that that's in every contract I've seen. What data do you have to provide? You better just plan on opening up all your farm records, all your farm books. 
They want everything you can think of from, you know, obviously like yields and production history. They want uh, information about soil. They want burn history, uh, fertilizer use, chemical use, weaning weights, conception percentages, all this stuff. And multiple of them say you consent to drone flights and imaging to be done on the property you have under carbon contract and any other property that you own or control. Who likes that? I know you don't. You want to know why? Because I get a phone call once a month about drones. What's the question I get asked? Every time, can I shoot it down? Every time. Okay? The answer, by the way, just a side note, the answer is no. And here's why. Drones are federally regulated by the FAA. As one might imagine, there are fairly severe penalties for shooting down federally regulated aircraft. So don't shoot the drones, okay? But also, if you don't want to sign consent for them to fly over all of your property, perhaps negotiate that out of a carbon contract, okay? Um, questions on carbon contracts. I, I, again, we've covered this last year. I don't want to keep beating a dead horse, but I still get questions on it, so I think it's important for us to at least hit on. Okay, perfect. Let's shift gears to an even more um, controversial topic and talk about waters of the United States. We've been doing this topic. I've talked about this topic at this conference for like eight years now. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Okay, so real quick background, then we'll talk about where we are. So we're talking right now about the Clean Water Act, which is a federal law. This is not state level, federal law. Okay, and back in the 70s, Congress passed the Clean Water Act to try and clean up the nation's waterways. Y'all have seen the like pictures and things on TV where like rivers were literally catching on fire in the Midwest because there was so much pollution. So Congress passes the Clean Water Act and it gives the EPA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers federal jurisdiction over waters of the United States. And so for ag, on a practical level, what that means is if you've got land that is considered a water of the United States and you want to do something on it, like apply a pollutant through a point source discharge, or you want to do what's called dredge and fill, but really it means move dirt on a water of the United States, you have to go get a permit from the feds. And that sounds simple enough, like I'll go, go well, I'll get my permit. Not simple. An easy, like run of the mill, Clean Water Act permit. Anybody want to guess how long that takes? A year is the average. Anybody want to guess what it costs? About $30,000. So I tell you that because this matters, right? This isn't just theoretical, like this really is a big deal. So the feds have jurisdiction and you have to get these permits if you have property that is considered a water of the United States. That's what the statute says. Guess what the statute doesn't say? What that means. Congress uses this term and then didn't tell us what it means. So for the last 50 years, we've basically had confusion and disarray and lawyers getting rich. That's what's happened. Okay, fighting over what is waters of the United States. I'm going to skip a whole bunch of cases and tell you just about a 2006 decision that was called Rapanos. In Rapanos, we ended up with what's called a plurality opinion where the Supreme Court justices voted four to one to four. That sounds weird. The guy in the middle, Justice Kennedy, and he said, I agree with Justice Scalia's group of four what we would call conservative justices. I agree with them on the outcome, but not how they got there. So that's why he's a one. And so what did they say? How do we figure out if it's a water of the United States? Well, the four justices in the plurality said, has to be a relatively permanent body of water. That's Justice Scalia's approach. Relatively permanent body of water. Justice Kennedy said, no, 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 I don't like that test. I think we should say it's in if it has a significant nexus to a jurisdictional water. That's the kind of test I like to call mushy. I don't know what that means. 
Neither does anybody else. That's why we keep going to court over and over and over. Okay, so we ended up with that. And then in 2015, the Obama administration came out and said, we're sick of all the confusion. We're sick of all the uncertainty. We're going to pass a definition of WOTUS, Waters of the United States, that's going to clarify what this actually means. They passed that in 2015. A big part of that was Kennedy's significant nexus test. Uh, and lawsuits abound, right? We have lawsuits all over the country. It was a big mess. Um, and then President Trump gets elected, and he repeals it. So he gets rid of the Obama definition. And right before, like in the days leading up to him leaving office, President Trump passed a, a definition that was more in line with Scalia, relatively permanent bodies of water. So that passed in 2020. And then what happens? Lawsuits abound, OK? And that definition has now been repealed as well. President Biden's administration wrote their own definition uh, that was announced on December 30th. It's going to be effective on March 20th. Does anybody feel like perhaps a, a definition swinging with the pendulum of presidential elections is not the best way to run a country, right? Who could fix this? Who could fix this tomorrow? Dr. Fisher's friends in Congress, right? Congress could pass a definition tomorrow and all this goes out the window. But until that happens, right, I'm not holding my breath, so we're gonna go ahead and look at the Biden definition. Um, basically, the way it's written is it, you're, it's jurisdictional if it significantly affects or is a relatively permanent body of water. So it basically put the Trump rule and the Obama rule together and said if you meet either one, it's jurisdictional. So I think it's fair to say this is the broadest of the three definitions that we've seen attempting to um, deal with this rule. I, I'm not going to bore you in all of the details here. The one thing, uh, you know, like I say, Tributaries is a good example. Tributaries of a navigable water that are either relatively permanent or alone or with similarly situated waters in the region significantly affect the chemical, physical, or biological integrity of a traditional navigable water. Lawyers, what did my dad say about lawyers? Right, that language is why. Here's what I want you to think about. My family has a farm in New Mexico about a mile from the Canadian River. Okay, we've got like a, a little pond on that farm. It's got water in it. Would I say that farm is, or that that pond, it doesn't abut the river, doesn't neighbor the river. It's not a wetland abutting the river. But if you took that little pond and thought about it in conjunction with every other little pond in the region, could they have a substantial effect on the chemical, physical, or biological integrity of the Canadian River? I, I don't know. I feel sweaty when I think about it, though, right? So let's look at what it means to be, have a significant effect. A material influence on the chemical, physical, or biological integrity of traditional navigable waters. See all these words that I'm not reading to you? Those are the factors that a court can consider to decide if my dad's little, I really call it a tank, my dad's little tank has an effect on the Canadian River. That whole list of things there. If you're my dad and you need to move some dirt around the tank, what are the odds he's going to be able to figure out how a court would apply these factors to answer that question? Probably not super high, right? So I don't really care what your opinion is on the rule. I'm not giving you mine. I don't know about the content of it. The one thing I will say I think is frustrating from a landowner perspective is, and, and, and this is true of all the rules, I don't care which administration has put them forward, the lack of clarity for the landowner who's just trying to do the right thing. It's frustrating, and I don't understand why we can't come up with a rule that's just clear, clean cut, we can figure this out without having to hire lawyers and geologists and I don't know whatever else people that do water science are called. Okay, so um, there are exceptions that exist. Prior and converted cropland remains an exception. Interestingly, in the other, in the Obama rule and the Trump rule, groundwater was expressly excluded from the definition. 
it was not excluded from the Biden rule. Now, Biden says it's because groundwater's never been a WOTUS, we don't have to exclude it because it was never in. I don't know. That's how this rule was written. Okay? But wait, there's more, right? This is like the, the shopping ads on TV at night. Uh, lawsuits have already been filed against the Biden rule. It hasn't even gone into effect yet. Two big ones have been filed here in the state of Texas. Um, in the Southern District of Texas, a number of trade groups, so several ag groups, but also some real estate groups, development groups. Uh, American Farm Bureau is in on this one. National Corn Producers is in on this one. They filed suit uh, against the rule. So did the state of Texas and all of the um, state agencies listed here. So we've got lawsuits filed. There's going to be more all over the country. I'll be back next year with more of this same story. The other part, and this is going to segue into our next topic, there is a case at the United States Supreme Court called Sackett versus EPA on the exact question of how do we determine the, the meaning of the Clean Water Act. And I think it's super interesting because I would have suspected the Biden administration might hold their definition till they saw what the court did in Sackett and then like revise it accordingly. They didn't, they put theirs out. Now by June, we're gonna have an opinion from the court in Sackett. What's that gonna do to the rule that they've now created? I don't know, uh, but I think it's interesting. So with that, let's talk a little bit. There's two big cases at the US Supreme Court. Sackett is one of them. Uh, the, the backstory in this case is there was a couple who bought a piece of land near a lake in Idaho. They're gonna build a retirement home there. Um, so we've got like a lot where they're gonna build their house. There's a road that separates it from the lake. So they go start building their house. The EPA, I don't know. I don't know if they came by or saw it on the map or the drone, I don't know. But the EPA finds out about it and says, hey, wait a minute, you can't build a house there. You can't move the dirt unless you get a permit from the Corps of Engineers because that lot is a water of the United States. Because we think it's an, it's an adjacent wetland to the lake. So they've been in court for years fighting over this lot. Um, this time, in this opinion, what they're looking at is the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, so that's the federal court in California for the West, California, Idaho, Washington. They said that it was a WOTUS. They said using that Justice Kennedy significant nexus test, there was a significant connection between that lot and the lake. There's a, a connection here, even though there's a road. Second, say we shouldn't be using the significant nexus test. Only one justice liked that test in the first place. Why are we using that as our test? So that's the question before the US Supreme Court. Did the Ninth Circuit correctly apply the test? They had oral argument in October, so we'll see what happens. I think one of the most interesting pieces of this is the court today is very different than the court in that 414 opinion, right? Because who wrote the opinion for the four? Scalia, he's gone. Who wrote the one opinion? Kennedy, he's gone. Who was the leader of the other four? Ginsburg, she's gone. So I think it's gonna be really interesting to see where the court shakes out uh, on this case. We'll have a decision by June. And like I say, then I think even more interesting to overlay that decision with the Biden rule that will be in effect likely uh, by then. So. That's one case. The second case I actually think is more interesting. It has to do with Proposition 12 in California. Y'all familiar with this? Okay, I, this is really interesting stuff. Case is called National Pork Producers Council versus Ross. Several years ago, California voters had a ballot initiative called Proposition 12. And they passed it and basically what it said, I, I'm high leveling this, okay. Basically what it said was, um, California pork producers have to abide by certain animal welfare standards if you're gonna raise pork in California. And there's rules about how many square feet of space they have, the, the pig has to be able to turn around and, sounds like the hokey pokey, right? Turn around, not touch the wall, whatever. They have these rules. Okay, that's fine. They pass them in California. If you're raising pork in California, you have to abide. That's no problem. That, they have the right to pass that rule. But it goes a step further. 
And it says this is true not only for pork raised in California, but for all pork sold in California. So if I'm a pork grower in Texas or Iowa, and I'm going to sell pork into California, which, by the way, is a chunk of the market for pork in the U.S., about 17%, I have to abide by the California rules. Now, that hits a little different, right? Why does that seem different than them legislating just for the people in California? Because now who's making rules for the pork producer in Texas? The voters in California. And so there were some groups that didn't like that. So we had a lawsuit filed by the National Pork Producers Council and the American Farm Bureau Federation that says it violates the Dormant Commerce Clause. And so, again, I think it's an interesting argument because what California says is, listen, we are only legislating in our state, right? What can we grow here? What can be sold here? We're not making the guy in Texas do anything. He can choose to do it or not, right? Whereas the Pork Producers Council is saying, well, wait a minute, practically speaking, you're forcing everybody's hands and you're imposing this on the whole country. So I think it'll be interesting to see. Of course, as with most things, this isn't just this one rule. States all around are passing these rules, right? Massachusetts has one. Uh, there's another one, maybe it's Vermont, another state up in the Northeast. And so what we could end up with, and I think this is a concern, right, is sort of a patchwork of rules about if you want to sell pork in this state, you got to follow this rule and then this rule for another state. And if you're a pork producer, you don't know really where your pork is going to go. So you've got to try to follow them all, or we've got to have a system that tracks it. It, it, it could be a real mess, right? The other thing I think that's interesting to, to think about, anybody know the percentage of pork production that occurs in California? Not very much, right? Less than 1%. So if I'm thinking about this from a California voter perspective, I pass this law that doesn't affect producers in my state, but has a big effect on producers everywhere else, right? So much easier to pass that law in California than it would be to pass that law, an example, in Iowa, right? where you've got more pork producers. So I think lots of interesting things to watch there. Um, the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit dismissed the case. They said there was no claim that the law did not violate the Dormant Commerce Clause. The Supreme Court took it up, had oral argument in October. Again, we'll have a decision by June. The other thing from like a nerdy lawyer perspective is I don't know how the court shakes out here. Like we sort of think about the Supreme Court and think, okay, well, these six are conservative and these six are liberal and they're going to vote that way. There's no liberal and conservative really here. I, I think it's going to be an interesting mashup to see who lands where on this case. But like I say, I think from a, a, a broad, bigger picture, broader perspective we need to be watching, this could have real impacts depending on how this case comes down. Okay, let's come a little bit closer to home and talk about the high-speed rail and the Texas Supreme Court. Y'all follow this one at all? I realize it's not really in our area, but again, I think an interesting case. Uh, Texas Central Wail Railway is a company that wants to build a high-speed rail from Dallas to Houston. Okay, um, What kind of land is located between Dallas and Houston? Rural land, right? Farmland, ranch land, rural land. As you might imagine, not every landowner between Dallas and Houston is thrilled that the high-speed rail may be coming to their pasture, right? And so the high-speed rail went out and it bought a bunch of right-of-ways, you know, the easements that it needs to build its uh, high-speed rail, but some landowners said no, okay? And so the, the TCR says, well, if you won't sell it to us, we're just gonna condemn it. And their theory is there's a statute in Texas that says railroad companies, that's one statute, and that interurban electric railways, that's another statute, have eminent domain power, okay? So just like the state of Texas could condemn road for a land, if you're a railroad company or an interurban electric railway, you can condemn property for a railroad. TCR says we're a railroad company and an interurban electric railway. As such, they want to come on Mr. Miles' property and conduct a survey. And if you have the right to condemn property, you have the right to survey it. They go hand in hand. But Mr. Miles says, wait a minute. I don't think Texas Central Railroad can use eminent domain. Anybody want to guess why? Why can't they use eminent domain, he says. 
They're for profit. Well, it doesn't matter if they're for profit because they, if they qualify as a railroad, they're private. The state of Texas can give private companies eminent domain power through statute. And so here, if they're a railroad or an interurban electric railway, they can condemn even if they're private. What he says is more practical, less legal. He says, how can they be a railroad that they don't own any tracks or any trains? They're an LLC on paper only. They shouldn't be able to condemn. Okay, so that's his argument. The trial court agrees with the landowner. So the trial court in rural county agrees with the landowner, says, yeah, you don't have eminent domain power, Texas Central. The Austin Court of Appeals reverses and says, yeah, they do have eminent domain power because they're a railroad. So we go to the Texas Supreme Court, and initially the petition for review that the landowner filed was denied. Okay, then they filed a motion for reconsideration, and those never get granted. Except this time it did. So this is like lawyer soap opera, right? Like now we're, the court's going to reconsider and they're going to hear the case. And so I, what I thought was a super interesting move, right? So this case is landowner versus Texas Central Railroad Company. The Supreme Court says, okay, we got all the briefs from the parties. Hey, state of Texas, we want you to weigh in. Do you think that the Texas Central Railroad should have eminent domain power? What do you think, state of Texas? They said no. State of Texas wrote a brief and said, we do not think that this company has eminent domain power. They should not be able to condemn this property. But then the Texas Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Texas Central Railroad Company. So Texas Supreme Court says they have eminent domain power as an interurban electric railway. There are a, a bunch of different opinions, several concurrences, several dissents. I'm not going to go into all of the details. Um, I, I'm going to hit on kind of two of them. One of them, Justice Devine issued a dissent and basically said, hey, I don't think they have eminent domain power, but it's for a reason different than the parties argued. Justice Devine said, I actually think that the real reason that they're trying to condemn, what they're trying to argue is the public use, is economic benefit and increased tax revenue. That's spilled all over their briefs. They keep talking about that. Look at all the good this railroad's going to do, all this tax money and increased revenue and da-da-da. And there's actually a provision in the Texas Constitution after a case called Kelo from the U.S. Supreme Court that says increased tax money and revenue is not a reason to allow eminent domain. So Justice Devine would have denied it on those grounds. That wasn't argued by the party. Could that be argued by another party against this later? Yeah. So pin that for later. Um, the other, there's three justices that dissented, Huddle, Devine, and Blacklock. They basically said, look, this wasn't what the framers intended. When they were talking about interurban electric railroads, when this statute was passed in the 20s, they were talking about literally the trolley car that ran from one end of town to the other. They weren't talking about elevated trains that go, I don't know the number, 500 miles an hour, right? This isn't what they intended, and we shouldn't construe it that way. So interesting case, but again, the, the answer from the Supreme Court was that they do have the power to condemn the land to build the railway. Now, lots of questions, I think, on if that railway ever gets built. If you follow the news, they're having lots of trouble. Um, the CEO resigned. They don't have the money for the project. They actually got sued um, for not paying taxes on the property that they purchased for the project. Like they bought this land, and they didn't pay the taxes on it. So lots of issues going on. We'll see if it actually comes to fruition. But that's what the Supreme Court had to say. Um, OK, last big case. This one, I think, also is a little bit surprising for folks if you're not familiar with this area of the law. Um, it's called Foot versus Texel. What happened is there was a rancher who lives actually in eastern New Mexico who has a bunch of cattle. And he leased a place uh, in central Texas and took his cows there. Okay, hired a local guy to like look after the cows and check on them. On the property, there was oil and gas operations, right? So there's like a, a pump jack and storage tanks and these type of things on the operation. When the cows got there, it was already there. Uh, the cattle, and, and so the pumper who works for the oil and gas company put up an electric fence around the production area to keep the cows out. Cattle kept getting in. They kept breaking the fence. They didn't care, kept getting in to the production site. 
Uh, one day, cows get in there, end up, I think it's assumed at least that the cows break a flow line. We get oil spilling out everywhere. We get salt water everywhere. And 100 cows die from exposure and ingestion. So the cattle owner files a lawsuit against Texel, which is the oil company, saying that they basically were negligent, right, breached their duty in not fencing those cattle out. Okay? The answer here uh, from the Eastland Court of Appeals, and, and this really is kind of the long-standing law in Texas, an oil and gas company has no obligation to fence your animals out unless you require that in your oil and gas lease. If he had put it in the lease, they would have to do it. If you don't say anything about it, there's no obligation for them to fence them out. And, in, and the fact that they went ahead and did it, you know, the company built the fence, doesn't matter. They didn't have any duty to do that at all. So, um, again, I think there's an important case to be aware of if you're running uh, livestock in an oil and gas area. Okay, three cases I'm going to hit on for honorable mention, and then we'll do my pet peeves. Uh, back to the drones, for those of you who are interested in that topic. Uh, Texas had passed a law that was sort of related to drones and privacy. Um, I think they passed that in 2013 or 15, one or the other. Uh, and it basically said that you were not allowed to use a drone to fly over private property and capture images um, that were used in conducting surveillance. I don't know what that meant. That's going to be a problem here in a minute. Okay. Then it also said there are certain critical infrastructure facilities drones can't fly over. Um, CAFOs were included in those, so feedlots, dairies, things like that were included. You can't fly a drone over those areas. But for each of these, there's a whole bunch of exceptions. So like, you can't fly a drone over private property if you take pictures to conduct surveillance, but they listed like 20 people who could do it. Real estate agents, commercial purposes, law enforcement, researchers, universities, there's a whole list. The press wasn't an exception. And so the press basically said, hold on, wait a minute. If you want to pass this law that says you can't use a drone, that's fine. But when you give all of these other exceptions, why are we not accepted, right? This is violating free speech, the First Amendment. And the court agreed and said the statute did violate the First Amendment. So there's now no law related to drones and privacy uh, in Texas. So that was stricken. We'll see if the legislature tries to come back this session with a new bill, but that one was stricken down um, early in 2022. Interesting case from, again, from an eminent domain perspective came from down south called Lavinka versus HSC Pipeline. This case was super uh, weird from a factual standpoint in that we had a landowner who bought, I don't have the amount of acres, I think it was like a thousand acre property, and his sole purpose for buying it was he wanted it to be a pipeline corridor. So basically, he like, buys this ranch, and he's like, come on, pipelines, you want to come through? Start paying me. And there's 25 pipelines going across his ranch. They're just lined up, right? And so there's a company that comes in, HSC, who wants to condemn for a pipeline. And they're offering him, like, hardly any money. And he's mad because there's not enough money being offered. And the landowner wants to offer evidence of what other companies, not using eminent domain, but just arm's length transaction, what other companies have paid him for those pipelines. He thinks that's relevant evidence to have. And the, the other company said, no, we can't introduce that. That's not pertinent evidence. The court said it was. So rare occasion probably where you're going to have 25 pipelines and you have arm's length transactions to show but the court said if you do have that, they can be introduced into evidence. So I think uh, interesting from an eminent domain perspective. Uh, there was another case we won't go into that basically there was a uh, estate dispute about who owned surface water rights when there was a problem with the deed. And at some point, one of the parties said, well, the TCEQ determines water rights. And the TCEQ was like, hold up, no, no, we don't want to be in the middle of who, we don't do with who owns it. We deal with granting them, but we don't, ownership of this is not our business. The Supreme Court agreed um, the TCEQ doesn't control water rights. Okay, so those are just a couple other things that came up. Now, I want to talk to you about pet peeves. Y'all got any pet peeves? Anybody got one? Lloyd, I know you're a guy with pet peeves. What's your pet peeve? He, 
He pleads the fifth in case his wife's listening on the radio. <laughs> okay, who got a pet peeve? I'll tell you a couple of mine. I hate cupcakes that look like other types of food. Right? Like, this is a cupcake that looks like a hamburger. I don't want to eat that. I'll eat a hamburger if I want a hamburger. I want a cupcake if I want a cupcake. So I don't like cupcakes that look like food. Bart, you got a pet peeve? None for Bart. Oh, that's disappointing. Okay. I also really hate it when defense gives up a conversion on third down. I'm an Oklahoma State fan. I got a lot of experience with that. Okay. These are my pet peeves. I have two legal pet peeves I want to hit you with today. And I want you to go home and fix this problem if it's yours because it's my own pet peeve, okay? The first one is this. If you have a farm or a ranch lease that is not in writing, please get it in writing. I'm putting it on my tombstone. Farm and ranch leases have got to be in writing. And let me just tell you this. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I mean an actual written lease agreement. What I don't mean is like a one-page form you can get somewhere that you fill in the blank and it says your name, his name, how many acres, and how much money. That's not what I mean. Get your leases in writing. And if you're a tenant, if you are farming land as a tenant, you need to make sure that that lease, or at least a memorandum of it, gets recorded in the deed records at the courthouse. I know, look, I see his face. He's rolling his eyes at me. I saw his face, okay? I know that this seems like legal mumbo jumbo. I've had two calls this week on this topic. That's why I made this slide. Let me give you the story. A producer in the panhandle leases property from a landowner he's known forever, absentee landowner, okay? This guy's kids inherit the land, and now the kids live somewhere else. He leased it for five years. Okay, he did not record the lease in the deed records. Kids who now own the land sell the property, don't tell him they sold it, don't tell the new buyer that there's a lease on it. Okay, new buyer comes in and he's like, what lease? We didn't get any notice of a lease. And this guy's like, well, I got a wheat crop in the field. What am I going to do now, right? I've got all these inputs, my wheat crops in the field. He calls me wanting to know, can he take that crop to harvest? Do you want to know what the answer is? Probably not. Probably not. Because that owner, the new owner, bought the land without notice that there was a lease on it. Okay? It should have been disclosed. Clearly, the kids selling the property should have disclosed that to the new owner. So great, the new owner could sue for you know, proving up the disclosure, but the wheat farmer can't. He wasn't a party to the contract. If that contract, if that lease had been recorded in the deed records, then everybody would have been on notice and his lease continues through the amount of time that the lease lasts. Just recording it would have saved this guy's lease and he's not in the mess of a situation that he's in. So I'm begging you from a tenant perspective, and, and as we see more and more land change owners, and we're dealing with more and more people who've inherited land that don't live here, this is going to become a problem. Uh, it's going to keep being a problem. So that's number one. Number two is sort of on the same lines. If you are relying on someone else's property to access your own, right? Your neighbor lets you drive across his land to get to your place, right? We just got a handshake deal or my grandpa and his grandpa crossed each other forever. You better deal with that now. Because again, I'm telling you, I get phone calls on this at least once a week. You've got to get those easements written down and recorded in the deed records. Because here's what happens, and it's happening all the time, right? Grandpa let you drive across his property, no sweat. Grandpa dies. His kids inherit the farm and they sell it to somebody from California. They're always from California, right? So they sell the land to somebody in California, and guess what happens? Those people say, you're not coming on my property, right? Texas is the home of private property rights. Get out. You can't cross me. They may be right. There are a couple of ways you could argue for an implied easement, but they're hard to prove, and you have to go to court to get them. 
Handle it now. While, while your neighbor's grandpa is still alive, get your easement written out. Make clear who can cross, where can they cross, how wide is the easement, whatever. File it in the deed records. Make sure you have legal access. Because hear me, if you don't have legal access, and nobody has to give it to you. You can have landlocked property in Texas. I deal with this at least once a week. If you don't have legal access to property, you can't sell it. Okay? You can't borrow against it. Nobody can get title insurance on it. It's a mess. I mean, I, I literally have people call it all the time. What do we do? The best option is to sell it to one of the neighbors who would have legal access to it. But guess how much money they want to offer you for it? Nothing, because if they don't buy it, you can't sell it, right? So truthfully, I'm not just being like annoying lawyer. I'm not here for the union, okay? If you've got leases, get them written. Tenants, push to get them recorded. If you've got any sort of easement or if you're just crossing somebody to get to your property, pay them. I don't care. Go pay them to get a written easement you can file on the deed records. This is going to save you and your heirs a lot of hassle later on. Okay, there's my rant. That felt a little bit sermony, sorry. But I get fired up, okay? Um, with that, this is my contact info. If y'all have questions, if you need information, I'm sure glad to help with that. Um, I'll take questions on, on th those topics or anything else. We've got a couple minutes probably if you have questions. Lloyd, I should have known. Okay, two good questions from Lloyd. One thing he said is for those of you guys that have leases, um, big issue if you've also got irrigation equipment on those leases and you end up in a situation where it gets sold out from under you, the land, you may end up in a fight over your irrigation equipment. And again, huge problem. So please deal with that up front. Um, his second question was either for me or for Bart on what we, whether we think we'll see carbon type programs or provisions in the next farm bill. I'll defer to Dr. Outlaw. He, Dr. Outlaw. Sorry, Bart. I'm so sorry. Bart says thumbs down. He says no carbon programs in the next farm bill. That's Bart's take. I'll defer to him. Okay. Yeah, Caitlin says that she gets calls from like new landowners, right? Who like inherited it. Yeah, we get calls all the time at our office from new landowners, and they're like, um, I live in Houston, and I just inherited 3,000 acres in Crosby and Hill County. What do I do with it? You know, and they're like, do I keep this guy? I don't know who he is. I mean, it's, it's scary. And they won't come to any type of landowner education to educate them about being a new farm owner. And so, you know, it, it is like, oh, my God, Tiffany wants me to get a written lease on all of this stuff. But... Y'all, the landowners call our offices and they ask us what to do. And of course, you know, we're here for you. We're on your side. And so we want you guys to, you know, have your stuff, your irrigation equipment and, and your whatever crop may be growing at that time protected because I'm not allowed to testify in any more cases at district court. Okay, with that, that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, if you would please help us by stacking the chairs, that would be of great help. And please throw away any.